Would you like to comment on the level of support from the Americans for what's going on in Israel? And when we do hear occasional condemnation about the, um, the way they treat the Palestinians and uh, breaking of UN conventions and all that kind of stuff, but nothing ever seems to happen to change that. I'll be the first to, to say that it's great to blame the Americans, and I'll do that in a moment. Um, but I just want to also say that it's not just the Americans. Um, and I think there's a lot to say about, obviously, the UK government as well, um, including military support to Israel, both selling arms um, and buying arms. Um, and I think that it's important to kind of put that in that context as, as well. That said, yes, the US is, is one of Israel's biggest supporters, and that also comes with a lot of funds. Uh, just last month, um, a new agreement was signed for the next 10 years of US military aid to Israel, um, increasing what used to be $3.1 billion a year to $3.8 billion a year. Um, and I think that one of the really important things to understand about that is that it's not just Israel, uh, the US giving Israel um, money for arms, it's specifically the US giving Israel money f to buy arms in the US. So the biggest lobbies for this are lobbies like Lockheed Martin, the big military companies um, who are actually making a profit out of it. And the other side of it is that it's, it's a, it goes both ways. I mean, Israel has a lot to gain from this in weapons, and the US has a lot to gain from this because then US weapons are used by the Israeli military and the same kind of marketing system goes both ways. Um, so it's interesting to see how much the interests there are, are intertwined. That said, they do contradict the official policy line of the US, which, as you said, is against the occupation, for um, two-state solution, against settlements, and yet willing to fund all of those arms that make sure that the settlement projects can continue, that the occupation can continue. Um, and that kind of goes back to the place of really the gap between what people usually say that they believe in, um, definitely on a political level, and what they actually do on the ground. And I think that a lot of our work is about closing that gap and saying, well, if you're saying something, you have to actually stand behind it in your actions as well. I wonder what kind of treatment you had when you were imprisoned uh, for conscientious objection and what the attitude is to conscientious objectors generally in Israel. So the question was about the treatment uh, of conscientious objectors in um, prison and in general in Israeli society. Uh, so I'll start by saying that the prison itself is a military prison. Um, which makes it far easier than kind of the, the usual image that we have of prisons. Most of the people there are deserters. Um, we're talking about around 70% of uh, soldiers in military prisons are there for desertion, and about 90% of them desert for economic reasons, because they literally can't afford to serve in the military. You don't get a salary, you get a stipend, and if you're part of an income of a family, you can't afford to do that. So military prison is not a scary environment, um, it is a very uh, first poor environment, like most prisons are. It's marginalized parts of Israeli society. And as part of that, a very right wing environment. Um, and so most of the inmates were not exactly supportive of my politics, to say the least. Um, that said, I think for me, it was a really interesting experience because it was the place where you could speak the most critically about the military in an open way and have that discussion because everyone there hates the military. I mean, they're, they're in military prison. Um, and, it's, and it's interesting to see how you can, from that angle, actually have a lot of conversations that you can't have within the Israeli establishment left, <laughs> um, because for them, the military is, is holy. But you can have it with right-wing uh, people who are willing to just question it much more and kind of have a, a different aspect of, of critical thinking. Um, so on that level, I, I can't complain about the, the treatment there. And, and it was, uh, I mean, it's not a fun experience, um, but it's not that bad relatively to, to prisons, at least. Um, as far as society in general, the main issue about refusal is really the choice to kind of take yourself out of the rest of society. There are some consequences that are technical. We can't work in jobs that need security clearance um, and things like that. But for the most part, the, the issue is that military service is such a big part of Israeli society that when you don't do that, it's, it's the conversations that you have with people that are like, oh, you look familiar, where did you serve? You know, that's kind of how you think, it, it's like asking which college did you go to to make sure that, you know, how do you know that's the question that you ask? Um, so it's kind of really just making any small talk conversation into a heated political argument. <laughs> um, and I think it's, it's much more, yeah, that. And, and also the fact that 
in effect, even if you don't always want to do that, what you're, the message that you're kind of conveying is criticizing the person in front of you. I mean, you have that conversation and they ask, well, why didn't you serve in the military? And you say, well, I'm against the occupation. I think it's immoral. I think it's immoral to serve in the military. That's actually what I'm saying. I think what you did is immoral. And I, I, you don't need to mean to say that, but you put yourself in a position in which that's a constant conversation. This is very much linked to that. I was interested in the information you were giving out in the early part of your speech about the close link between education and the military and the element of sort of brainwashing that goes into conditioning. I, I was particularly wanting to find out a bit more about your own personal upbringing because I'm concerned not just for yourself but for other people who are about 17 years old on the brink of being conscripted about the aspect of the social stigma and particularly within the family unit in terms of bringing dishonour and that sort of situation and the pressure that that must bring to bear and whether in fact it ends up that people are then to be disowned by the families. So if you could perhaps just explain a little bit more on that side. Um, so I have to say that personally I've been extremely lucky. Uh, my family is very supportive. Uh, my father started being politically active more or less when I did um, around the beginning of the 2000s and, and since then has continued. And so I had a lot of support um, at home, which is extremely important. Um, that said, a lot of my friends don't um, and kind of have a, a running joke that there's always uh, a couch at home that's, that's ready for refusers who, who don't have a place to stay because they have kicked out of home. And I've had quite a few friends um, that that has been the case for them, at least at the beginning. Usually it's a process and eventually families actually, from, from my experience at least, prefer supporting their, their children even if they don't agree with them at the end. But it's, it's quite a conflict and for many people um, that's a deciding factor to continue to serve in the military or in some cases to get out of the military without a public statement because of the way that their family will react um, and because they don't want to stigmatise their family. Um, in many ways, like I've had conversations with a lot of people who say, it, I don't want to refuse not just because I'll fight with my family, because I don't want to put my mother in the place where she has to fight with her entire family about my choices. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a big, a big part of it. Please. Hello, I'm Cathy. Um, I've got a question. I'm particularly interested in how you persuade people that your position is the right one. And also, I was interested in, in your on Twitter, I've been tweeting. Um, do you use social media? If so, is it proving a help? Or is it in fact proving a bit of a hindrance? Do you get people coming on and trying to troll you and what have you? Um, I'll start with the second question. Uh, I, I do have Twitter, but I hardly use it, I have to admit. Um, Twitter hasn't really caught in Israel. Um, but social media in general, especially Facebook, it's definitely a tool that we use a lot. And I think that specifically in the kind of work that we do about raising awareness around refusal, it's always helpful because even if a lot of the traffic is very negative um, and like nasty comments and stuff like that, um, for us the importance is to actually have youth understand that it's an option. Ask themselves the question about refusal. And in that case, any kind of exposure is, is very helpful and we see it. Like every time there's a refuser um, going to prison, all the comments around it in social media will be very negative and yet we'll have dozens of people writing us personally being like, I need help to get out of the military. Um, so in that case, it, yeah, we use it a lot and it's, and it's very helpful. Um, as to how to convince people, I don't think I have a good enough way yet. Um, I think it, it really depends. One of the things that I really try to do is many times start with people in, in a place in the conversation where they can engage with. And that can, for instance, be talking about gender dynamics in the military and how does that affect us as women. Forget about Palestinians for a second, forget about the occupation. What does it mean for you as a woman or as a 17-year-old about to go into that system? Um, or the other side of that, um, really talking about kind of the economic interests around military operations um, and, and the fact that at the end, you know, 18-year-olds are the ones who actually have to die in that while all these politicians are making an economic profit that we can literally show out of it. And kind of trying to make this a question also of your own interests and not just for the sake of Palestinians, which is important, but many times isn't the first thing that resonates with people when you talk to them. In 2014, I spent three months, almost four months, 
living and working in the West Bank near Nablus. And every week I came in contact with uh, Israeli peace groups, like breaking the silence and rabbis for human rights. How influential do you, do you think these groups are in shaping Israeli public opinion and, and <coughs> in influencing government policy and actions in the, uh, in the West Bank? I think Israeli um, civil society or left-wing civil society, if it's NGOs or, or just grassroots uh, activists today, uh, you can't see a lot of influence on a policy, on a political level, almost at all. Most of the political system is very much against them, speaking against them, legislating laws to, to try and make uh, the work of organizations like Breaking the Silence and so on as hard as possible. Um, that said, you do have quite a bit of successes on a local level through the judicial system. So a lot of these organizations will have lawyers working on a specific piece of land that is owned by Palestinians and settlers are trying to take over it. Um, and, and, you know, the lawyers will be representing it in court and activists will be coming to the land with the Palestinian owners um, enough times and possibly even getting arrested, but enough times until eventually the Palestinian owners can work it. So you have like these on the ground successes. But if we look at the overall political system, no, we're not making leeway. We're, the, the Israeli society is becoming more and more right-wing. Um, that said, I think it's important to say that it's not only a question of where Israeli society is going, but also where the international community is going. And in that case, Israeli NGOs talking about human rights violations within the international community is something that is very strong and does influence decision makers. And we can see a lot of the international community moving towards a, a more pro-Palestinian um, approach towards things, and hopefully that'll have an effect on the ground as well. 30 years from now, what do you think is practically achievable? Practically achievable, and what would you like to have achieved? So there's two questions there, isn't there? That is two def very different questions, yes. <laughs> um, honestly, I'm not an optimist. Um, and 30 years from now, I think that, that there's a good possibility that things will look more or less the same um, as far as Israeli policies, only the Palestinian areas will be smaller, more cantonized, um, and kind of the same policies continuing at a whole. Um, there's also a fair opportunity, that, uh, a fair possibility that things will get worse uh, dramatically. There's talk now within Israeli political system about annexation of Area C um, of the, the Palestinian areas. So this is a most of Palestinian land with very few Palestinian people. That's the, the main idea of this annexation. Um, and, and that's kind of the same policy. It will be cantonization, uh, but even, even more drastic. That said, if you ask me about 50 years from now, I'll tell you things will look completely different. I don't believe, I, I completely believe the occupation will end. It's not sustainable in any way, shape, or form, uh, both because of Palestinian resistance, because of the shift in the international community. Um, eventually, it will come to a breaking point in which the occupation will end. What that looks like is a completely different question that I honestly have no idea where to start um, to, to address. As far as what I would like to see <laughs> in that 50 years down the line when the occupation ends, um, is that for me, I think many times there's a discourse about one state or two state, that's kind of the, the usual discourse. Um, and I think we should be able to nuance it a little bit. Uh, a lot of the criticism around two state solution is, it's actually one piece of land infrastructure-wise, size-wise, where the settlements are located today, um, you can't really draw a line and separate it. A lot of the arguments against one state are, well, there's two very different societies, um, and they're not going to just all be happy together um, in, in a moment that you just say that's the political situation. Um, and I think that there's actually a lot of middle ground to that. Uh, there's a lot of models around the world of cantons, of, of federations of sorts from Belgium through Switzerland and so on, um, of what can it look like to have cultural autonomies that are autonomous um, and will, for instance, in Jerusalem, speak Hebrew versus speak Arabic versus maybe even speak Yiddish um, and have their own education system and, and their own culture and tradition and religion, but in one federate system that doesn't require you to have different passports, to, to uh, not allow people to travel and to decide for you where you're going to live within that context. Um, so that's what I would like to see. I'd like to point out to you that uh, I've lived in the States eight years. 
And when I spoke about the plight of the Palestinian people, one of the favorite things they used to say in the States is that there always will be one, because it says so in the Bible. But in the Bible, it does say, blessed are the peaceful, because the rich before the children of God. And another thing, too, I had some of these religious organizations that said that uh, the return of the Jews would mean a second coming of Christ. And that, uh, I just like to bring it to your attention that these things should be condemned. Um, I've actually had uh, quite a few um, chances to speak in evangelical Christian communities in the US, which are kind of the prominent voices around that, uh, including Christian Zionism and kind of supporting um, Israel. And I, I think that one of the really interesting things about that is the level of just ignorance around the issue. They had no idea, absolutely no idea what was actually going on. Um, and kind of the, the gap between that discourse uh, that they're talking about that's very pro-occupation and pro-Israel no matter what, and then you actually start having a conversation with them um, about the details of what it looks like, and they're like, oh, no, we don't want to support that. That sounds bad. <laughs> um, and kind of, I think it's important that, that in these cases um, to really try to break down for people what the reality is, and, and sometimes that manages to break through. Other times, obviously, people's theology is something that's very hard to break through and, and kind of people are very passionate about it. Um, but I do think that we should, we should try, at least. I don't know whether I'm sort of jumping to a head, but I wanted to really ask about um, how in this country we're reacting uh, to the situation in Israel and Palestine. I just wanted to say also that as I listened to you talking at first, you, sound, you made it sound so simple and straightforward about the issue. But of course, in response to the question, what you had to go through is not simple and straightforward. So thank you for that. Um, in this country, I think lots of people here would perhaps agree with me if I said that if we start to speak out and worry about the situation in Israel, we are accused of being anti semitic mm -hmm. And I'm finding that extremely difficult how to, how to address. And also the issue of disinvestment, not only of military, which I think everyone, would, most people would agree that we shouldn't be involved with the military export and import, but also say to do with universities and <coughs> academics of breaking that um, contact, if you like, that there is a campaign to break those out. If I'm not sort of um, I'll try to comment on all of that. Um, just as an anecdote, last week, two weeks ago, uh, the American consulate sends, sent out to a lot of his different Israeli organizations that they're in contact with um, a gift for the holidays, the high holidays that are coming up next month. Um, and it was, it was like chocolates and I don't know what else and wine. And the wine that they sent was from a settlement. Um, and the reason that I bring it out is not, not because it's, it's just funny and ironic, it is, but um, because the reason that that happened is because the settlement economy is such a big part of Israeli economy, you can't really separate it. And a lot of the times the kind of discussions about boycott and divestment are around either the military industry or just the settlements, just the occupation, again, because it's easier, as you say, like everyone kind of supports it. Um, and there's, it's important to mention that, that it is one economy. There is no Israeli occupation and, occup and, and sorry, Israeli economy and occupation economy. There's one economy, um, unfortunately. <laughs> and, and then that's something that, that we need to both be able to say, but then also to counter. And you, know, you said like academic um, collaborations between universities as opposed to military collaborations. Actually, many times they're the same collaborations. Like you look at a lot of the technology that, I don't know, uh, Cornell University in the US is now starting a new academic project with a Technion in Haifa. Um, that project is around drone development. <laughs> that, I mean, that's the, what the Israeli Academy is also doing. You can't separate, again, anything civilian in Israel from the military system because we don't make that separation. Um, and so I think that that's like, as far as where do you put the line, we don't put the line, so you, you can't put it anywhere. Um, as far as anti-Semitism, I think this is a really, really important thing to, to address. Um, 
on the one hand, you have the, the simple fact that for Israel, it's very, very convenient. And they've done a very good job at trying to make Judaism, Zionism, Israel, and occupation all mean the same thing. You, you criticize any of them, you've criticized all of them. And I think part of it is really just showing how people's own identity doesn't follow that logic. You have right-wing Christian Zionists who are not Jewish, but pro-occupation and Zionist. You have Israelis who are against the occupation. You have Israelis who are not Jewish. You have like, I mean, there's any combination of those four identities can happen. And I think it's important for us to be able to break that down. But more than that, one of the interesting things about um, kind of Israel really saying that any anti-occupation thing is anti-Semitic is that in many ways it strengthens anti-Semitism. Um, because we're in a situation now where, I hate to say this, but anti-Semites actually have legitimate arguments they can use. They can criticize the occupation and through that criticize Jews. And because Israel's already put that all in one box, it almost sounds reasonable. And I think it's really important for us as a movement to make that separation. And among other things that does say, that does mean when, things, when people say things that are anti-Semitic within our movement and they exist, to call them out and to be very clear that that's not the framework we're working on. On the contrary, the framework we're working on is an anti-racist framework. And that includes anti-Semitism, it includes Islamophobia, it includes a lot of other forms of racism. And we should be really, really clear that that's what we're doing. We're working within an anti-racist um, framework. Um, I suppose it links a bit to what Robin said about the um, aims of the Amos project, about hope. And um, <coughs> did you say just now that you weren't very optimistic? <laughs> but I, I just wondered if um, you maybe had two or three examples that were you know, of, of dialogue or action that you were taking place that, that were of hope. And also a very small question, which is, um, if, are you able to go into schools? I mean, and, and you, you, when you're doing the work <coughs> of raising awareness of other options, um, go to youth groups, presumably, but it's about, because it is about that dialogue, one of the things I was aware of through uh, uh, people who've been, is, is that um, it's so hard for people from Israel to visit or find out about Palestine and vice versa. So, you know, what in what ways are you trying to <coughs> make sure that there is that more of that knowledge that can overcome the um, the strength of the Israeli state? First of all, no, we can't go into schools. Um, New Profile, which is the main organisation working against militarisation in Israel, is the only organisation officially banned from schools in the entire country. Um, and, and more specifically other organizations as well just won't be able to get in because teachers and principals are afraid. They're afraid of putting that in and then getting criticism from the Ministry of Education, especially now when we have an extremely right-wing Minister of Education. Um, that said, there's a lot of other opportunities to talk to youth. If it's youth movements, um, if it's pre-military academies that for some reason really actually like inviting people to talk about refusal as far as they're concerned it's kind of like to, s to check the box and say we did also show an alternative you know but it's an opportunity it's an opportunity to talk to youth and again on social media there's a lot of opportunities to talk to youth that are not through establishments which is far far um, easier to do as to um, examples of, of things that are working or that are a little bit more hopeful uh, I think one of the, the main things that for me is extremely helpful in continuing to be active is really look for small victories. Um, and part of that, for instance, is helping people out of the military. Um, and so we, for instance, that there's a counselling network that helps about 2,000 people a year out of service. That's, some of them are 17-year-olds before military service. Some of them are 19 calling us in the middle of service and want out. Um, and that's something that, you know, you, you get called by a really scared 19-year-old um, and within a week or two, they're out, they're released from the military and they're free people. Um, and, you know, having those kind of successes for me is, is very re rewarding and kind of allows me to, to continue the work. Um, 
I'll give another example from a little bit of a different uh, field. I was talking a little bit before about this combination between NGOs and grassroots um, activists in trying to uh, have Palestinians work their lands. Um, so for instance, there's an area uh, called the South Hebron Hills, just south from Hebron, um, in which there's a lot of those efforts of small Palestinian communities who are actually displaced com uh, completely in the end of the 90s, but slowly returned to their lands um, and with the help of Israeli activists uh, and of NGOs and legal work have managed to get hold back of, of quite a bit of their land and are able now to go and work without Israeli activists present um, in their lands in a lot of these areas. Um, there's also downsides to that, and right now we're dealing with a lot of demolitions in that area. There's always something happening, but still being able to say that community actually returned because there was a community of activists, uh, both Palestinians and Israelis, who helped that happen and, and made sure that they'll be able to um, resist the occupation. So for me, those are kind of two examples. But they're small. Hi, I'm Mishuda, um, and I work for Kirklees Council. Just to say, Saha is not banned from UK schools, <laughs> and we actually had the pleasure of hosting Saha at one of our schools today, a high school. And I have to say, it's predominantly Muslim school, and I think it's absolutely great what you did today, this afternoon, so thank you. And it was about dispelling myths. I think a lot of it is that, especially with the young people, they're thinking all Israelis are the same, all Jewish people are the same, and I think like what comments you did get from the young people was that they were actually complete all of yourself that there was the other side and i think it's really important to make that public that there is people fighting for peace within israel within jerusalem but just another thing uh, this is the question is that more and more we're saying that the military is going to schools even in the uk and it's becoming the norm they're going to community events and people are just accepting it what can we do as peacemakers um, to counteract that in a way, in a positive way, obviously. And I have to say, I'm eternally hopeful that one day there will be a peaceful solution. I think the first thing is is just to talk about it. I mean, it was interesting to, I'm just going to give the example of this morning, uh, this afternoon in the school. Um, I was saying something about um, when was, the, like asking the girls, when was the last time you saw a soldier in school? Um, and then the principal of the school was like, well, <laughs> we, you know, have them in career day. <laughs> um, and, and they started thinking about it. Like they, the, the, the faculty was starting to talk between themselves, being like, oh, maybe we shouldn't actually, now that we think about it. <laughs> that actually sounds like uh, something we should question. Um, so a lot of people just don't think about it, don't even question it. And I actually think that here in the UK, um, as opposed to Israel, where it's like not only a norm, but really an ideological norm for most people, here it isn't. Here many times it's just the default. People don't think about it. And just pointing that out, can actually go rather far. Um, the other thing is, uh, yesterday in Newcastle, I was just uh, talking to a person from Veterans for Peace. I know there's one here as well. There you are. Two. Two. Um, so you can uh, contact them afterwards. Um, there are people uh, who can also talk about, from the place of going through that, talk about what the military actually is. Um, and what you actually have to go through that, both on a personal level and what you're doing to others. And I think that that's also something that's really important to bring in. Like, you can make a pretty reasonable argument to a school saying, well, if you're going to bring soldiers in, you should also bring something to balance that, kind of what are the other aspects of that. Um, and I think that, that that's going to be another direction. You, you, that picture you had of those kind of three main pictures, that's that kind of brainwashing, but what was the moment for you, you know, so kind of a young, was it something that came from the family, from your parents, or was it something, what was that kind of moment that you decided actually, you know what, this isn't for me, what kind of led you to that? Um, at about 12 or 13, uh, it was the second intifada, the second Palestinian uprising, um, I'm from Jerusalem, so buses blowing up on the streets, kind of, uh, a lot of the images that you probably got here on the TV. Um, and my father got invited by a friend to a day of planting olive trees in a Palestinian village. Um, and I kind of grew up in a house that was against the occupation, but we didn't much talk about what the occupation was, like it wasn't very detailed. Um, and, and I went with him to, to that Palestinian village. And we were planting olive trees, we were changing the water pipe of the village. Um, it was a relatively very high educated village, so most of the kids spoke at least a little bit of English and we kind of communicated in some kind of sign language. Um, and at some point, one of the Palestinians kind of brings us all together, points down at the valley and says, this is where they're going to build the wall. 
um, which at the time didn't exist. We didn't really know what it was. And I kept going to that village for quite a few years and saw the olive trees that we planted being uprooted and the water pipe that we laid down dangling over the fence for about four years. Um, and this village has its private checkpoint. Um, it has a checkpoint with a list of names with everyone in the village and only they can go in and out. And you know, I talked to kids my age and the things that they were bothered the most by was the fact that you can't invite friends over from school. Like it's not, you know, it's not the huge human rights violations that you hear about bombing Gaza or whatever. It's like this very daily reality of you just can't invite a friend over. You always have to go to their place. Um, and for me, like understanding the gap of realities between my life and their life literally 15 minutes away uh, was just kind of starting to understand what occupation was and went all downhill from there. Um, I do think that there is change happening in the Jewish uh, diaspora um, and I wondered if you agree that that's happening and whether you think that there's more that we could do and how, how could the Jewish diaspora be more helpful? Um, yes and yes. <laughs> there's definitely a shift in, in Jewish diaspora. Um, you can see, I mean, in the US it's the easiest to see just because the community there is both very big and, and very vibrant and, and vocal. Um, but today, organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace, which is the main Jewish anti-occupation organization in the US, um, is the fastest growing left organization in the US. That's huge. Um, and, and, the f and you speak to kind of my generation of, of Jews um, in the US specifically, they, I mean, th they just don't want to represent Israel anymore. They can't. They can't defend that anymore. They don't want to be in a place where they need to. Um, and so you see more and more anti-occupation activism. I can also say that f even from a place of people who are not at all politically active or so on, um, I have parts of my family who are in Italy, uh, and they're you know, very mainstream Zionist Jews in the diaspora, um, like part of the established community. And talking to them after the attack on Gaza in 2014, one of them was saying, I mean, I, I just can't defend it anymore. Like, I keep being asked about it, and I just, I don't know what to say anymore. <laughs> um, and I think that the, the Jewish community abroad is coming to a turning point of saying, we, we, I mean, we've been supporting Israel, but we can't support this. This is, <laughs> like, we just can't justify it anymore. Um, but as far as what can be done more than that, um, first of all, I think that, that it's, it's really important that you know just more Jews do do that and, and are vocal about it and as you said kind of there's a place for Jewish for a Jewish voice that's different than, than other voices um, but I think that there's there's also a place to try to create alternatives to it because today it seems that at least for secular Jews um, Zionism is the identity that's offered and I think that there's a place for diaspora communities to try to ask themselves what does Judaism look like separate from Zionism um, and not necessarily religious. I mean, what, what, what does cultural Judaism look like and so on? And start to actually create that. You have a, a really cool group here in the UK called Judas. Um, I don't know if you, anyone's heard of them, uh, but they do kind of cultural um, Jewish issue, things that are just not Zionist. Like it's not even about Zionism. They don't need to talk about Israel or not. They go to Spain to look at like, Jewish radical culture in Spain, you know, that they're trying to look at what does it mean to be Jewish aside of Zionism, because it, it, it's just the last hundred years that that's become part of Judaism. And there's so much of a culture before that. So I think there's a place to, to also just develop that. Is there also a flip side to that? Is there a bit of an elephant in the room where actually um, the Muslim community, us as Muslims, uh, um, certainly within this country, um, it's, it's probably not something that we criticise the Palestinian side of it, Hamas, and, and some of the behaviours that, that obviously create problems for Jewish communities there around that. And, and how does that work with the work that you do in Palestine? You know, is there, is, there, is there a group of people that are actually sort of kind of challenging Hamas and some of those kind of views? And you see that, that those pictures that you show from a Jewish side, you see those images there where they're training people from a very, very young age as well, and even within that side of it. And it, and it is kind of two sides of the same coin, really, isn't it? Yeah. Could I just add to that? Um, one of the criticisms that we sometimes find is, uh, is these, they're actually bombarding us with rockets. Um, I mean, is that a valid argument, or is that is that something that's just 
it's, it, I mean, clearly it is an issue, but how much of an issue is it? If it could just add, add to that question. Yeah, and you had a question as well. Um, I'm not sure you mentioned, do, do you know any Palestinian people as, as friends? Okay. Yes, <laughs> I mean the office that I work with in I'm the only Jewish Israeli. All the rest are Palestinian, and, and that's kind of my daily life. A lot of my friends are Palestinian. Um, I, it, it's not necessarily easy. <laughs> like there's there's power dynamics in that. There's things that need to be confronted. Even the language, like what language do we speak, um, is is an issue. But yes, you can definitely. Uh, a mixture of, usually a mixture of mostly English, a little bit of Hebrew, and I'm working on my Arabic, so it's them correcting my <coughs> Arabic most of the time. <laughs> um, but yes, definitely it's there, um, especially when you come, like, you know, you, you come to protest week after week, you also get to know a community, and it becomes much more than just people you're protesting together with, but really have relationships with. Um, I suppose, uh, as, I mean, as far as Yes, there is Palestinian violence. The rockets coming in from Gaza, uh, especially the south of, of Israel, um, are definitely an issue. And I mean, I don't live under that threat, um, so I don't want to belittle it. It definitely exists. It's important to say that it, there's nothing proportional about it. I mean, yes, people in the south of Israel do live under threat, do need to evacuate into shelters when they hear the alarms. People in Gaza don't have alarms, don't have shelters to go into and, and you, I mean, I, it's not a numbers game and it shouldn't be, but you see the damage within Palestinian society in Gaza versus uh, in, in Israel. Um, that said, yes, there are rockets, there is Palestinian violence. Um, it's important to say when we talk about organizations like Hamas, it's not only Palestinian violence towards Israelis, it's Palestinian <coughs> establishment violence towards Palestinians as well. Um, both Hamas government in Gaza, but also the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank arresting journalists on a regular basis. I mean, there's a lot of human rights violations done by Palestinians. Um, I think that the question here is, what is our role within that? Um, and first of all, I'd like to say that in general, I don't want the international community to try to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That's not your role. The Brits have had their try there. <laughs> Hasn't worked too well. Stay away, please. <laughs> um, that said, what I am asking the international community is to stop being involved, because you are at the moment. You are right now supporting Israel, again, by buying and selling weapons, by giving political support, by making sure, together with the US, that no uh, resolutions in the Security Council will ever be against Israel. You are right now actively supporting Israel. And you're not actively supporting Hamas. I mean, if you were, you'd actually be jailed in this country. <laughs> so because of that, for me, your role is about changing the policy towards Israel. And Yes, Palestinian society needs to deal with human rights violations within it, and, and there are people who are active on it, and you know, people I work with, Palestinians I work with, are not just acting against the occupation, they're acting against forms of oppression and human rights violations. But the question is, what is your role in this?